Hey everyone, welcome to Full Count. And today we have a special guest who's a loan officer and a great friend of mine who's going to really break things down regarding HELOC loans because in our last episode you had seen us discuss it but we mentioned we want to bring on an expert. So we have that today and as you can see, I'm at my home office. It's going to be a great episode even though my co-host will not be here with me today, uh, Stephen and Nick. But I hope you enjoy and let's get to it. Three balls, two strikes, pressure is on. This is where we discuss real estate, property improvement, and business. Together, we'll strategize on how to win. Welcome to the Full Count. All right, everyone, welcome to Full Count. We have my good friend and loan officer, Matt. How are you doing today? I'm good, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Thank you uh, for being on. We could really uh, use your expertise and everyone watching or even listening uh, I know they'll appreciate this. So if you can go ahead and, um, you know, provide your background, brief introduction, how, how long you've been in the business and how we met would be awesome. Sure. Yeah. So my name's Matt Settles, as you said. Um, I've been mortgage broker here in L.A. for about 12 years now, going on 12 years. Uh, really been focused on uh, pretty much every aspect in, in real estate. I do residential, commercial um, construction loans, ground mm -hmm. up, and all your traditional uh, mortgage loans that are out there. And so 12 years, so you've kind of seen a little bit of everything, right? From the residential to commercial then. Um, I imagine, you know, with all that, you know, nuances of clients, I would imagine you have different types of clientele and different needs that have different complexities, such as different loans. If you could kind of expand on that, the differences between conforming and jumbo and how you kind of... Um, uh, you know, tailor your service to each different person. Yeah. So to get back to your first point, yeah, I got into the business 2008, you know, before I moved. Worst to, time, to, right? To, yeah, really. And I got into it when the economy was at its worst. So I, I've definitely kind of seen ups and downs and now we're going back through it again. Maybe um, we'll see. Yeah. It seems like we're, we're definitely in a slowdown for sure. Um, so I'm kind of seeing it that whole cycle. Okay. So you've been through that roller coaster? Um, a little bit. I mean, I got into it at the tail end when it was kind of in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I'm seeing it from the start and we'll see what happens yeah. you know, in the next few months. Um, but as far as the clientele, yeah, I, I mainly focus on LA at this point in my career. I used to just do all of actually really nationwide until I moved to California uh, where I was strictly licensed in California. So we just focused on, on California. Uh, it. But now it's more tailored to local uh la and sometimes up north so uh, but i am licensed to california so we just you know we do all the deals we can yeah i mean there's a lot to be had in uh Cal in california itself but los angeles is gigantic so uh it's such a large county and things like that so i imagine you have so many different clients um so for example for me uh my clientele ranges from first-time home buyer to developers to people buying very expensive homes right uh different loan amounts or they're just paying cash uh, depending on you know how large the price is and how much to their knowledge I have to speak to them a little bit differently so with the first time home buyer you almost kind of hold their hand and tell them every step of the way the more advanced buyer kind of already gets it and they don't really want to hear it all but they want to know more about the market stock market real estate market and things like that so if you can just deep dive on your types of clientele uh, the ones that have like conforming loans FHA and jumbo loans and kind of what the difference is between those um, would be great. Yeah. So, I mean, I work with a full range, full spectrum of, of borrowers, homeowners, mm -hmm. uh, ranging from, like you said, uh, first time home buyers that are putting down lease down payment, which may be three or three and a half with FHA, maybe 5%, mm -hmm. um, you know, all the way to seasoned real estate developers that are doing ground up construction loans. Um, and then in the middle, you have your, you know, second, third time home buyer types, um, maybe that are upgrading or, or sure. downgrading for that matter, or buying a second home or investment property. So yeah, really I work with everybody. Um, uh, and that goes for your clients or whoever, you know, whatever realtor I may I be refer. working with at the mm -hmm. time. Do you have a specific, that's like your favorite, uh, type of client in terms of like, um, their experience, whether they're the ones that buy their third, fourth home or the new first time home buyer or whatever it may be like a developer. Is there one in particular you tend to like most or are you open to everything? 
I mean, I'm open to everything. I'm not going to shy away any, any business. Uh, sure. Probably, Especially uh, now. Exactly. It's slowing. slowing down. Uh-huh. Um, but my favorite type of borrower, obviously I would like to work with people that have been in the business before. I like developers. I've, I've mm-hmm. kind of built a pretty strong business on those types of clients. Um, okay. And they're repeat clients and people I've been working with for years. And that, you know, that goes with seasoned real estate developers and uh, real estate investors and developers. So How about real estate agents? I imagine you like the, someone a little bit more, what is it, like seasoned? Or you, are you okay with someone brand new to the game that you definitely, can assist? Definitely okay with somebody brand new. But, uh, okay. So whoever's watching right now that might be a realtor or a developer that might be new, you are you welcome them is course, what I'm hearing. Course, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm here the whole way. I, I hold whoever it is, whether it's the the, the buyer, the, the borrower, or the realtor. Um, I'm mm-hmm. going to hold your hand the whole way, every step of the way throughout the process and, and guide you through it to make it as smooth as possible. And that's, that's what I do. Great. I mean, at one point you met me when I was brand new to the game. If you kind of want to, uh, you know, bring up how we met and things like that, and maybe why you even decided to uh, work with me, because at the time when I met you, you were already seasoned. This is true. Yeah. yeah. So you were working with a, a mutual friend of ours, um, Sam at the time, Sam real. Mm-hmm. And I think you were maybe in, I don't know if you were an intern or an assistant with him, but at first, yeah, at first I'm saying, Mm -hmm. um, but I could definitely see the hunger in your eyes and you're still to this day, a very hard worker, which is, you know, great. Probably one of the hardest working agents I've seen. Oh, nice. I appreciate Um, that. Still. Yeah. You still put in so much, you know, so that's, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, I I even, I even put in on the golf course, you know, I was never experienced golfer, but during COVID I, I figured we need to find a way for you and I to, you know, still have a conversation besides the phone because everyone was on lockdown. So I thought, you know, picking up a game of golf would be helpful. And now you and I tend to do that, which is amazing. And that's how we meet clients, right? I know you've met some clients of yours at the uh, the association you belong to. Um, do you have any stories in regards to that of someone you came across that is now a good client of yours from just the golf course alone, having a beer? Um. I've definitely met a few people and we're, we do talk, but I don't, I don't know if I've really turned any deals out of it. Um, okay. I didn't really join it for that reason. That's, that's also a bonus, but the golf sure. course I play all the time, it's a uh, Braemar country club, but um, yeah, that's there's, there's guys I talk to, but right now with, with where the market is, everybody's kind of on standstill uh, to see what's going to happen, especially with the higher, higher loan amounts. Cause those increased interest rates, it means a lot more to higher loan amount sizes, right? So prices, if the costs have gone up so much more and may continue to do so. Um, mm-hmm. Right now we're getting a little bit of a pullback, but kind of- When you say high loan saying. amount, what's a high loan amount to someone like yourself? Because from my point of view or you know, someone else, it might be a different um, amount. So what's a high loan amount in your eyes? I would say anything over a million dollars. Okay. Probably like a jumbo loan, anything conforming loan amounts are- 970 800 970 thousand eight hundred dollars uh, okay so anything over that's considered jumbo and i would say that's a higher you know uh, the last few years my average loan amount has probably been a, over a million bucks but sure you know, with, with this um inflation going on right now those type of clients are kind of on standstill uh sitting on the sidelines uh see what happens and maybe there's an opportunity if there's a some type of pullback in, in values, which we're starting to see a little bit of a stagnant, um, mm-hmm. you know, people yeah. are price, price reductions and stuff like that. But those people are definitely on the sidelines waiting for the opportunity to, to jump on. Is there a certain uh, price amount where the buyer essentially doesn't really get um, swayed depending on like the interest rate, if it's going really, really high, isn't there some buyers out there that no matter what the interest rate is to some degree, right? it doesn't really affect them. Is there like a, would you say like 5 million price point and higher, maybe 10 million or they don't really care because maybe they have a different scenario, whether it be hard money or maybe cash. Well, cash buyer is definitely going to be, that's not even somebody I deal with. That's somebody in your, in your world. But Mm -hmm. um, I do have definitely have real estate investors that don't necessarily care about the interest rates as much, especially those, using the non-QM, more non-traditional loan types where they're qualifying with bank statements or mm-hmm. possibly just the cash flow of the property. And as long as the property is cash flowing, uh, whereas the rents are covering the liabilities each month, they don't care so much about the rates. 
What, is, what does non-QM stone, uh, non-QM loan stand for, though? Uh, non-qualified exactly. mortgage. So that, that's a loan where mm -hmm. the borrower doesn't have to provide the bank with tax returns. And okay. that's been a huge stepping stone for, for my career, too, and in, in getting to those type of borrowers that not, won't necessarily qualify with a retail bank, such as like a Bank of America. Uh, okay. And those, are, those tend to be real estate investors uh, more often than not because they just don't like to show as much income on, on their tax returns. And then some lenders won't allow the real estate income to be used to qualify. I see. So that's where I come into play. And that's really helped me really build my business uh, to where it is today. How did you build that business though? Because an investor like that isn't easy to come by. So were you cold calling like, like I tend to do now, uh, knocking doors, going out to very exclusive um, lounges? How, how did you get to that point? Because I think people watching would really you know, want to know how you kind of broke through. And I know it's kind of difficult too. I mean, I definitely put in my time uh, in the first five, six years. Yeah. Um, cold calling. Definitely cold calling. I would call 100, 200 people a day sometimes. Wow. Uh, just going, just blowing up the phones, you know, and um, it was just a numbers game at that point. So, um, and you would maybe hit one out of 20 people realistically, and then maybe close one out of 20 of those deals. I don't know. So it was just it's a, a very game. small yeah, yeah turnover for sure, rate. For sure. But if you can stick with it, uh, and a lot of people aren't, a lot of people aren't cut out for that. You know, they, they get burned out really quick. Uh, that's not something that I did. I just stuck with it and worked hard like you do. Um, so you don't fear rejection at all, definitely. right? Not really? No, I mean, in I the mean, beginning, look, in the beginning, it's definitely there's some fear there because it's just any like anything that's new. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but once you get past those and conquer that stuff, get over those hurdles. You know, look, I've heard everything, everything, anything you can think of, which we won't go into detail, but I've heard it all. And I'm sure you have too. Yeah. yeah. When you call those leads, but um, there's people, some people just don't want to hear from you and whatever it is, whatever the excuse is. But um, yeah, but once you do enough of those and close those deals, it builds confidence. Right. Sure. And, um, <clears throat> and then from there, I started doing a lot of open houses and probably with you, I went to a few of those. And I remember those days. Yeah. The realtors that, yeah, we used to do the open houses all the time, and especially in in Beverly Hills, where you where you were working. Uh, <clears throat> but those clients weren't necessarily my type. Those people don't necessarily need loans. But I was looking to build a relationship with the realtor, right, and, and get okay. those other clients that may need loans, like um, a conforming and, or a jumbo or like a non QM loan, like you were. Yeah, it could be any type noting. of loan, just somebody that's financing instead of an all cash type. I see. Uh, so. And, you know, I, I actually want to get into in a minute um, about HELOCs, right? But before I do that, I kind of want to jump into another topic in a moment. But I do want to address something here, too. I think it'd be great to have you on uh, for an, another time where you explain in detail non-QM loan, hard money loan, sure. conforming loan. Not today, but another time when we have more time. But in the meantime, I do want to bring up the whole um, thing I saw in the paper the other day, which was about having a nice curb appeal for your home but at the same time taking into account the landscaping because we're in a drought right now, right? So it's uh, very important to essentially not waste so much water. And I remember when I went to your house at the time, uh, you were looking to do something to improve it. So I'll read like a headline from the Wall Street Journal real quick. It's a designer named John Gidding. He's a host of HGTV. Um, and he basically says, um, Many of, it, of his beautiful strategies are classic, such as ensuring a clear sight line to the front door and pushing for a welcome lighting. And I just feel like your house, which I'll share right now, it has such a clear sight of the door, but at the same time, you really took into account the landscape and, um, and uh, you know, the drought consideration of things as well. So I'm going to share that right now. So here it is with the renderings, right, Matt? Yeah, and that's after we remodeled the front of the house, um, which mm -hmm. I did a couple months ago. Um, but then we took it into a landscaping company, and they they did this rendering, which was very helpful to actually kind of visualize what I was wanting to do. Yeah. Um, and basically, yeah, with with LA putting these water restrictions in, the grass was super green, as you can see. By the, so at the very front. Yep. Yeah. So the the grass was like that. It looked it looked great. Uh, it probably cost a lot of money to keep it that way with all the water. But since they've sure. been implementing these water restrictions the last couple months, 
it's impossible to keep your grass green, especially with these triple digit temperatures in the valley. Oh, for sure. And now when you got these renderings, though, wasn't it kind of I mean, this helps, right, uh, to give you an idea of what it's going to look like. But for sure. uh, were you a little bit cautious or wary about how it would end up looking? Um, well, at I was all? very I was confident in the guys I was with and, okay. and I knew it wasn't going to be this was just a sample. Right. So it wasn't going to be what it, what it, you'll see in a second, what it actually turned out to. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, show and I'm that just now. fully confident in the process. And to be honest, I'm even happier than I was anticipating. Look at that. Beautiful. So this is nighttime and it looks great. I mean, they, we did the lighting in the front and <clears throat> all the drought tolerant plants, which you can see in the daytime. Uh, there's probably a better picture you could pull up. I will pull that up right now. But what made you keep that color door before I get to the next photo? Because oh, so in the let me let me just read off uh, in the paper what this person said, who's like the expert. He said um, he learned over time that he could really push the front door aesthetic from a color perspective as far as he wanted, where almost any color would pretty much work. And specifically, he was saying for mid-century modern homes. So um, go ahead and answer that. Sorry about that. But it's I think it's just a beautiful color. Yeah. So so I purchased the home and the, the seller had painted the door or it's a blue door, as you can see. Um, they had this door that gave it a little bit of pop, yeah. um, a little more personality, if you will. Um, but yeah, it's a mid-century modern, Charles Dubois. Usually there's some funky colors. Like you're, you've seen probably orange. Yeah, or orange, red, yellow. Something, something that usually pops usually, and that's just mm -hmm. kind of a mid-century modern um, characteristic. Uh, but we left the door. A lot of people thought I should maybe paint it black. No way. I think that I would have taken it. away. Yeah, no, but it, it looks good. And it looked, it looked good when I bought it. And then once we painted and did everything we've done, um, I just kept the door. It just, it looks good. It fits it. Yeah. I, 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 I could, I totally agree. And I'm glad you kept it that way. Yeah. We took so, the rock off. So the house used to be fully covered in the rock face uh, around the windows. Oh yeah. And the front had a, had a, the Charles Dubois uh, traditional wall that he puts up. You guys are familiar with that, but um, you could actually walk up to the front door and even to the patio area, which we now have covered up with this uh, cedar. This right here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is now cedar wood, just little thin. Uh, okay, I thought maybe that would be cut in half. No, it's, it's red cedar. It's all red cedar, even along the entranceway. Uh, I see. Yeah, right here. Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah I thought that. I thought that was a nice uh, touch uh, you did there. So, so we ripped off the rock and the siding and replaced that with cement siding. It's actually called band board. Uh, it's a cement siding, which is the black that you see. And it's been painted. What, what is it called again? The black? Uh, what kind of material? It's called it's botten, botten board, I believe it's called. Uh, board. But it's, it's cement. It's basically a very thin layer of cement. Uh, Got it. That's dried out and then laid up on the house. And then they paint over it with the. It's called a black tie, a matte black tie painting uh, finish that we used. I love it. I think anyone watching or listening right now should really consider doing something like that to the facade and, you know, get that curb appeal because that's what gravitates people's eyes towards your home. And at the same time, you know, brings up the value of the home as well. So I think you did a solid job, Matt. I just yeah. wanted to bring that up. Yeah, originally, uh, we were going to do a pool and then we decided, just like you said, curb appeal is number one. Sure. Um, yep. Especially in a booming housing market that we were in the last couple of years. So I thought curb appeal is focused on that. If we want to sell the house, take advantage of what's been going on the last couple of years. I think that's a great call because you could put so much money in the backyard. Um, and if you don't have that curb appeal, like, sure. you know, like, as you know, if the, if the appraiser comes over, they're going to be like, okay, first impression from the front, not the nicest, but in your case, very nice. So I think that was a, a solid job yeah going this route and then doing the pool later if i want to that would just be the, the finishing touch cherry on top for somebody that wanted to purchase this home so yeah and so speaking of which too of your backyard uh you got a lot of critters back there I call you the safari guy i mean check this out you sent this to me today right look yeah, at this that this morning actually this coyote is peeking over yeah, unreal had these guys around the house uh a lot recently so it's got to be very weary of Who's it looks so backyard. small yeah, from here. I thought it was tiny. No, this guy was full grown. So if the video keeps going, you can see he's, yeah. he's a good size, husky size, I would say. Oh, no way. I mean, you're there in person. So, yeah. but I didn't, I didn't know it was that big. Yeah. It's a full grown coyote, <laughs> a hungry one too. So 
Jesus. Get aggressive and they can they can leap up six or seven foot walls with no problem. I'm gonna show that right now because you got another clip. Well, here here he comes coming down, right? Yeah, you can see him on the prowl and this is right ready to find something. Yeah, he's been looking at everybody's backyard here. Wow. I mean, there's been times in the morning where I'll come out, you know, six in the morning and he's sleeping. I don't know if it's the same one, but they're sleeping in the backyard. I don't know if they're just trying to rest or they're waiting for my little guy. But uh, <laughs> your little guy being your dog, right? Winston, correct. Your, your little yeah, dog, so Winston. We've got, yeah, we've got to keep our oh eyes God. peeled. There you go. So you can yeah, see. Let me, let me rewind it real quick. Here you go. Look at that. Look at that size. It's humongous. Jesus. Yeah, he's big. He's big. And he saw me. He heard me at this point. So Is that where you're knocking? Yeah, he's looking for me. So. That's that's unreal. Like, yeah, let's see can, him jump. Yeah, they jump up these. Look at that! Like nothing, like Damn. Nothing. Yeah. And it stares it, me down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's I've awesome. Been spraying, um, for anybody that's listening that may be dealing with this, I've been putting out the predator pee, which I thought was keeping him away, but I just really two days ago, and this guy came back this morning. So no, it looks like they're hungry then. No, definitely, they're looking for water, food, or whatever they can, whatever they can get into. You also got these guys. The hawks. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. What's he picking up there? You know, I don't know. I thought they made a nest, but I think they were I think they were tearing up a nest, somebody else's babies, unfortunately. Oh my gosh. They were in they were back here for about a week. Uh, there's yeah. a couple of them. Pretty annoying because they're just uh They're kind of they're, ruining your yard, aren't well, they? Well, not really. This is up in the mulch area, so I didn't really okay. wasn't that. It's just they make these noises where they're like chattering like it sounds oh. like a monkey. It's like a monkey, but super high pitch at all oh, times, man. just throughout the day, evening times. That's kind of annoying. Mating calls or oh. whatever they're doing. But yeah, yeah, they were that's hanging a... out for a couple weeks, actually, but they're gone now. Well, that's good. I think whatever they were getting into, they destroyed so and finished it all up. So. so they're gone. They're gone for now. They're definitely in the neighborhood. I see them still, but <laughs> they're not living in my backyard. That's awesome. Um, well, there you go. Anyone watching, if you got coyotes, um, or other types of animals in your backyard, I think Matt can assist you with that. Maybe he can give you some advice on how to get rid of them. Right. <laughs> I haven't gotten rid of them yet, but I know, I know, but hopefully soon you can get rid of them. But, um, I mean, nature is everywhere. Right. So, uh, I just wanted to share that cause I thought it was kind of funny. Yeah. It's never a dull moment over here. It's in, in Tarzana. So it's, that's, that's why it was named after the movie Tarzan. So. It's, it's real is that life. is that for real? I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, the guy that the producer of uh, Tarzan the movie, he named the city Tarzana because of the movie Tarzan. Yeah, because of the movie, and probably something to do with the wildlife because there's a lot of it out here, and, and we're is. just very close to the hills, to where yeah. uh, state parks and everything. And Malibu is pretty close, mm. uh, just over the hills, and there's all kinds of. I mean, there's mountain lions out there. And oh, that's for sure. Bobcats, I've seen them in my yard. There's there's all kinds of stuff. You've seen bobcats too? Yeah, yeah, I got them on the cameras. Yep. Wow, cool. Raccoons, bobcats, coyotes. Yeah. There you go. You got to keep your got to keep your uh, Winston little dog uh, away from him. So no 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 going outside, right? At night, <laughs> at least. Yeah, we gotta, um, we gotta we gotta be careful. There you go. Now, just just going back to you know the whole you know concept of full count. I just wanted to ask you, uh, what's your like latest full count moment, whether it be in career or whether it be in, in uh, personal life? Uh, full count moment meaning you know like where you have so much pressure, you have to make this ultimate decision whether it's going to break you or make you, or maybe it just improves your 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 lifestyle just because you made a, a decision. Yeah, so I was thinking about this full count to me. I mean, I, I played baseball my whole life too. So there you go. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah. Three, two count bottom of the ninth bases loaded down by a run. That's <laughs> full count, full pressure. So heck yeah. So much pressure uh, to me, my full count moment. Honestly, I was thinking about probably when I moved to California um, with my wife and girlfriend at the time, mm -hmm. we kind of just picked up and dude, we had nothing. Uh, we moved out with, our clothes and trash bags in the car and had our dog in the, in the back seat and kind of started fresh, um, really with nothing. That's and scary. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a major risk and it was definitely a culture shock moving from Atlanta, Georgia to Hermosa beach. Okay. Um, 
that was definitely my full count, the most pressure I felt, I would say. But um, I try to keep cool and even keel. Uh, look, well, Looking back, we made it work. It was definitely difficult. The first few months were definitely difficult. To um, adapt here in L.A.? Oh, for sure, yeah. Moving from the city, inner city of Atlanta to the beach. You can yeah. imagine that major difference. Now, did it take you and your girlfriend at the time, who's now your wife, uh, did it take you both a long time to make that decision? Or was it one of those things like, let's just get out of here and get on the road? Or was it something you really had to like think about? It didn't take too much thought, to be honest. We both got laid off from our jobs at the time. Cause like I said, that was 2010. Oh, okay. The downturn of the economy kind of, they're kind of bouncing back at that time. But I was just getting into the mortgage business, getting my feet wet. And yeah. she was working for the hospital and um, I think she got laid off for whatever reason. And, and so did I. Um, and I wow. had a buddy, I had a buddy that was, that was living on the beach and he needed a roommate. And he's like, man, if you want to take an opportunity, come out here and check it out, you know, and that's, that's what we did. And we never looked back to be honest. So <clears throat> yeah, thankfully it's a lot of hard work and determination. Yeah. It's paid off, but it was, it's, it's, it's definitely not easy, sure. but yeah. Looking back, it's, it's gone by really fast too. So. Would you have ever imagined the success that you have today? Did you kind of like in your mind, were you envisioning your success that you have today and what you probably are hoping for in the future? Or were you kind of just completely off guard and just came out here and were yeah, hoping for the really best? I didn't really ever look that deep into it, to be honest with you. I'm more living in the moment kind of. I wasn't really planning five or 10 years out. I, I knew if I couldn't, if I wasn't going to make it, I could always go back, you know? So, and that's kind of the mindset I had with Sunshine, but um we knew what we wanted and we knew we were gonna maybe raise a family someday and, and here you are now. now but yeah 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 looking well, back it well, seems kind of like yesterday but um a lot of time in between so a lot of things have happened in between but but here we are and we made it work well i'm, I'm really glad you did because otherwise i would have never met you right and formed that's that right. friendship with you um yeah that's right so good, good, good stuff. And I'm glad you as shared, as work, you shared yeah, that. As far as work goes, it's like coming out here and not having anybody or anything. Um, I wasn't anticipating being where I am or doing as well as we've done, especially over the last Because of no years. connections, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah, well, yeah, because we didn't, know, we didn't know anybody, right? So it's just literally starting from the ground up, you know, with, yeah. <clears throat> and building those relationships and just getting back to the cold calling, man. That's That's really what started it all and just going full speed. I think Not you uh, hit the nail on the head because that's, that's essentially why you were, you know, pounding the pavement with these calls, introducing yourself to strangers, because what I've seen in, in the industry in real estate, which is part of your industry too, with loans and whatnot, but some people that get a head start tend to have connections and that kind of propels them to move forward. But as long as, even if you have no connections and you are consistent, you, you can grow, right? Of course. Yeah. You just got to keep your head down and, and hustling just like you do. You're very good at it. So, um, thank you. Yeah. I, I came with no connections either when I came to start in LA. There's, there's people new. that definitely have stepping stones, but I don't think you had that. I definitely didn't have that sure. uh, other than just hard work and determination. And that's, that's hey, it, it may good. take a little bit longer to get there, but you, you keep working hard. It can happen. So, and that's kind of why we created this whole channel full count because, um, you know, no matter what cards you were dealt with in life, you just got to get to it and get it, you know, as, as, and just do the best you can, no matter what. And right. when the pressure's on, you just got to excel. Um, so with that being said, I want, now I wanted to just, um, to conclude, um, essentially I wanted to talk about the HELOC loans. If you can kind of, uh, explain what HELOC loans are, um, and maybe how they're different from, uh, cash out refis. Yeah, so a HELOC is, uh, first of all, it's a home equity line of credit. Okay. okay. Um, right now, I don't know if it's so advantageous to doing those just because rates have gone up and they're they're tied directly to the prime interest rate. Okay. Um, so every time the Fed has been raising rates, which has been um, every month for like the last three months, I would say. They're at around 2.5% now, 225 to 2.5% Fed funds rate. Yeah, that's the Fed fund. So the prime rate went from, I think, three and a quarter to now it's, I'd have to look at it, but I think it's about 5.75 or 6% at this point. 
And the, um, just to before you expand further, just to reiterate, prime rate, from my understanding, was um, it's essentially the Fed funds rate, but then banks add their margin on top of it, right, and give that interest correct. rate to consumers. Correct. correct. Okay. Let me just double check what the prime rate is today. Okay. Just curious what that is, but um, yeah. So the HELOC is definitely based off. So prime is five and a half percent. Um, okay, so it's kind of the same as mortgage rates right now. Yeah, it's but a little bit less. There, they were always kind of trailing each other. I think we got a, a connection situation. Here we go. Let's see. Okay, I I think you're coming back up. Um, let's start back from you. You were saying about they were trailing the HELOC loans were trailing something. If you can kind of go back to that. Yeah, I was saying that they were pretty much on the same level for for a while. Like what's the they the, the prime rate and mortgage prime rates? And traditional mortgage, like a thirty year fix. Okay, got it. Yeah, so prime is today it's five and a half percent, and that's pretty much where a standard thirty year conforming uh, thirty year fix would be. Right about okay. the same, um, but they're they're increasing those rates to kind of curb inflation. They want people to stop spending money, right? I see. <clears throat> and whether that's working or not, this is another another conversation. But another yeah, we day. can talk forever about that. But it, the HELOC loans, what are they used for, though? I know you said it's a home equity line oh, of credit, it's, it's but for, yeah, it's for tapping into equity. So if you wanted to do a, a home remodel or something and didn't want to spend your cash. I see. You can go out there and get a, a home equity line of credit with any retail bank or credit unions are really good actually. And they actually have better rates and in, introductory rates. Uh, I just got one of those myself, but uh, <clears throat> so you could look into a credit union and you could do that to uh, in lieu of spending cash to fix up your home or any type of home improvements or go okay. on vacation, whatever you, whatever you want to do really. But, so a line of credit, but I, I like, I, I mean, I think that's very beneficial because in general cases, they tend to be lower than the interest rate on a credit card, oh, the definitely. interest rate on many other things like mortgage rates. But at this point, mortgage rates and HELOCs are kind of head to head, but way less expensive than the consumer going to get a credit card to improve their home sure. or, or vacation or whatever. So that's that's kind of why I want to bring that up, because owning a home, besides being in your home and building equity um, and you know enjoying the memories in there, you can always tap into the equity in a smart fashion, because some people you know, they could use it for things that are very return on investment. But if you use it to upgrade your home, that's always pretty beneficial. 100%. Yeah. I mean, that's why it's called a home equity line of credit, really. I think it's, it's there More to targeted. improve the home. I mean, yeah. you can definitely spend it how you like, but um, the idea behind it is to put it into your home. And, and that's what the underwriters are obviously looking for when they're approving a loan. They want to explanation usually of what you're using the money for. And okay. you're, you should be definitely targeting uh, home improvements. Um, I will say the the one drawback with a HELOC is the rates adjustable. It's it's tied to the prime. So whenever that that prime rate adjusts, which it's been doing a lot the last three, four months, that oh, rate's wow. going up every time. So <clears throat> yeah. Can you lock it in for like two years? You can or... lock it in. Yeah. You could call the bank and they will allow you to lock it in, but usually it's a percent higher at least. Um, and usually that's like a 20 year fixed rate. So there's, you know, different lenders have different options and that's something you'd have to discuss with them, but. Okay. There are options to lock in the rate and to avoid those rate hikes that's, that's happening today. But um, then again, when rates come down, which hopefully that happens maybe in the next two years, we'll see what happens, but okay. uh, you would then have to refinance at that point, probably to, to reduce the rate. And then last question, um, cash out refinances. What's the difference between, or what is that, and how is it different from HELOCs? So a cash out refi is is basically paying off your existing mortgage, um, and then getting cash out on top of it. So you're still tapping into the equity the same as you would with a HELOC, mm -hmm. uh, but you're doing one new fixed mortgage, right? You're just doing one first oh, loan. Uh, so you're swapping instead of having a... two different liens, you're going to have one new loan, basically. So you're paying off the existing. Uh, and then taking cash out on top of that. Okay. That's a cash out refinance. So there's different benefits to the two, depending on the buyer or not the yeah. buyer, the homeowner. Yeah. The benefit would be avoiding the adjustable rates like prime. 
I see. You know, you could always get into an adjustable rate mortgage, but that's that's different. It's fixed for five, seven, or ten years, hmm. uh, versus prime, which is jumping every time they raise rates. So it's just a little less risk. Um, yeah, and you're fixing your rate at whatever the current market rates are on the full amount. I mean, that's that's crucial right there. What you just what you just said because. That, I think that's why it's so important to have an expert that can kind of sway you in the right direction from doing the refi, cash out refi or the HELOC, and then when to do it more so. And then looking at economics and prime rates with, you know, the Fed funds rate and how it's affecting and spilling over. So, well, Matt, I really appreciate you being on today. Your expertise is going to help everyone watching and listening, and we definitely need to have you back on. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate the opportunity, and I'd, I'd love to come back and take a deeper dive into all the different loan options. and you know, go into detail and explain. Yeah, we'll to the different borrowers and your clients. We'll definitely have you expand. And, you know, I'm going to throw out at you a lot more questions. Okay. Sounds good. Alrighty. Thank you.